Ken and Janet and Will, will you guys come on up? I think we have a couple more mics. Oh, you have them. Okay. So this is one of my favorite topics, and Shauna talking about challenges. Uh, housing is what a lot of us feel is one of the greatest challenges in San Francisco. And so I want to introduce uh, three of our people. I think a lot of us could speak into this, but uh, first I want to introduce Janet. Uh, she's the realtor I was talking about a while ago. She's lived in San Francisco for 31 years. So you might be the most veteran of us. Um, and she'll celebrate 30 years selling uh, sorry, residential real estate. And uh, she characterizes her style as a balance of visionary, coach, mentor, trusted advisor, and nurturer. And so we're super thankful to have Janet. We have Ken McCord, and he has worked in the hi a hybrid of ministry and business for 25 years. And uh, he told you he has three kids, ages 20, 16, and 14. They've been living intentionally with their family for the last 16 and a half years. And uh, Ken has been a renter for 13 of those years and a homeowner in the last three years here in San Francisco. And then Will and his wife, B, have two young boys. Uh, they are f uh, six and... No, seven and three. Se seven and three. Thank you. Let me get that right. And uh, they moved to San Francisco from Mill Valley three years ago, and they were renters in the Portola neighborhood up until last year, and they're now homeowners in South Beach. So as we get started, uh, just to kind of give us some perspective of where you guys have come from in the city, can you just share with us... Which neighborhoods have you lived in? And just give us a highlight from each of the neighborhoods that you've lived in. I'll start with you, Janet. Okay, I've lived uh, in several neighbor neighborhoods over the 30 years. Um, I know you two are gonna talk about one of the neighborhoods I lived in, so I'll talk about, I lived in a neighborhood that was, uh, before it was called Nopa, you know, before it was way back when on the um, north of the Panhandle. And um, it was kind of up and coming, and it was a nice experience to live near the park. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kelly and I have lived in three neighborhoods. So we lived uh, for a short while in the Ocean View Ingleside neighborhood, and then we lived uh, for 13 years in Bernal Heights. And we've been in the Viz Valley, Portola area for about three and a half years now. Uh, B and I, we moved from Marin to Portola. I pronounce it differently, but it's the same neighbor, Portola. Um, and uh, that was a great neighborhood, a lot of diversity. Uh, I, I believe it was 50, 60% um, Chinese, um, large African-American population, um, um, Hispanic. So it was a great neighborhood for us, parks, walking distance, shopping centers, um, the main part of the, ta of the neighborhood, two blocks from us, so it was great. And then we moved to South Beach, which we're two blocks from AT&T Park. I get to walk to work, um, so it's been a great transition for us, but very different neighborhoods. Yeah, and uh, we want to start by talking about renting, because I think all of us at some point will probably rent in the city, and I'm going to start with Will and Ken, but um, for people who want to rent for the next two to three years minimum in the city, what do you think they should look for in a rental property? F for us, when we decided to move into the city, it was important for us to find a uh, a rental situation that was rent controlled. Um, so we were looking at uh, multi-unit buildings or homes um, that were built before, I believe, 1979 or 1978, uh, because we couldn't, our, our income couldn't handle any large fluctuations. Um, so any major increases of $400, $500, of things that were going on during that time, that was very, we were very much aware of what was going on. and. You know, if you're in a unit that's rent controlled, as many of you know, the rent can only be raised by about one to three percent, and the city actually sets that percentage. And so, we wanted to know what we were getting ourselves into and what it would it could be down the road. Yeah, I think we, when we first showed up, we saw renting as an opportunity to to get to know the city. So for us. Uh, choosing a rental had a lot to do with which part of the city were we wanting to explore. And then we wanted uh, a space that was comfortable uh, within our budget. And then we wanted to have access to a commercial district to be able to uh, walk to an area where we could shop, eat, 
uh, do groceries. And then lastly, parks. Uh, we did want to have access to parks. So as we were looking, I think your wisdom is, is very important because the rent control in our case, we weren't able to live within that regulation. So over time, the rent went up quite a bit. Um, so I would think that's very important as well. If we could go back in time, we would add that. And just to speak, talk about the parks, San Francisco actually was uh, just uh, rated as the, one of the top cities for parks. And we now officially, every single person lives within 10 minutes walking distance of a park in the city, which is pretty incredible. Uh, Janet, could you also speak into that and then fill in any gaps with the rent control law so people know what, what they need to look for if they were aiming for rent control? I think there are, are times in your life living in San Francisco where renting is the right thing to do. Um, you might want to, as Ken said, explore a neighborhood, see how you like living in that neighborhood and get to know it. Um, also, your life might be changing. You're not sure about your job or your fam the size of your family. So um, to rent is, is a good opportunity. Um, there is rent control in San Francisco, which was created to um, allow for affordable rents um, when there was a shortage of rentals. Um, and ben, uh, Will said that uh, there is a limit to what the landlord can increase the rent. So those are for apartments only, not single family homes and not condominiums. Um, yeah, and you can, uh, just to clarify just a little bit, you can find a multi-unit home uh, and that can be rent controlled. Mm -hmm. Yes, so just not single family homes. Um, thank you. So for what do you advise people who are wanting to start the home buying process in San Francisco? What should they look for? And let's start with you two, and I'm going to get a little more specific with you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Kelly and I started the home buying process three and a half years ago, and I think from our perspective, we were 16 years late. Uh, so there are reasons we were late, right? We didn't have this large sum of money to put down on a home. Uh, but also we had a hybrid relationship to the city and so we came to the city as missionaries and were supported uh, by faith and so we didn't feel that it was the time to acquire a house. And so in our experience, uh, the first thing we needed to do was align with what uh, Ben mentioned, which is we needed vision. So we, we looked at the city through the lens of where, where do we think God would have us live? Where would we contribute? And uh, we also looked at what, what can we afford in that area? And so those were the two starting points. And uh, we, we started knocking on doors, you know, because not all listings uh, are, well, the listings are there, but not all homes that are for sale are listed. Mm -hmm. And so we started to talk quite a bit to folks uh, in the end, we did purchase a house in Visitation Valley that was listed. And for us, we wanted a relationship with the owner. And God blessed us with that in that process as well. Um, we, we never thought we would own in the city. We just, for our income and, and the cost of purchasing in the city, it, it, it just didn't seem feasible. Uh, but we got on an email list through the city for BMR units. So it's below market rate and it's for low to middle income families. And I remember actually sitting at Brad and Mary's house and this email comes in for a, uh, a new building that had seven units, four two bedrooms in South Beach, two blocks from AT&T Park. The price was it was 250000 for a two-bedroom, so you can imagine HOA's 850. Um, so you can kind of have an, oh, oh, we could possibly do that, you know? It's, uh, and so our ears um, perked up. Our hearts started leaping, like, is this possible? It was a year process. So I just say that to say that we, um, it was a miracle. I, I, that's the way I look at it. But we have gone through that process of purchasing a home uh, through the city, a BMR, and... Um, and we would be glad to have any conversations with any of you who uh, would qualify for that and then see how we can help you out. Because we only applied for one building, and we got it. And uh, we toured a couple. We didn't like any of them. We, we loved that I could walk to work, the area, everything about it. Um, so it's possible. It's possible. So Actually, I'd love for you just to briefly explain the process right now for oh, okay. the below market rate. Yeah, um, you, 
you have to take a class, and there's only five uh, organizations in the city that are um, approved to give this class. Um, so you take the class, and then you have to submit an application for each available building. Or So the, in the city, all these new constructions that you're seeing, for the most part, they're required to allocate about 12 to 30 percent of their units for um, below market rate. Um, and and um, and those could be one bedrooms, two bedrooms. I really haven't seen any three bedrooms. Um, now, the builders can opt out by paying a hefty fine, and that goes to the coffers of the city for housing for low to middle income families. Um, so our building is a brand new building. We're the first to live in our unit. Um, so we we put in our application, and basically there's a lottery, and it's not any anything grand or big, they are actually putting raffle tickets in a box and you get the other half and that's how you know. So we actually showed up to the lottery and we were number 26 out of 300 people that applied, which you know, was o with only seven units, it was like, oh, that's a little bit far off. We, we don't know if we could do that, if it's gonna work out. So fast forward, that was March, September, we actually start, started receiving some emails like, hey, send us updated pay stubs, send us bank statements. Like, why? Oh, well, you know. Anyway, it ended up like, hey, you guys qualify, you're in, now go get a loan. And, and so that was the process for us. And um, it was long and drawn out. Yeah, so from the moment I got that email, I met Mary and Brad's house, that was January, we ended up moving in, moving in on December 1st. And I, I love that Ben talked about uh, how much faith is required here. And um, I think that in the city, it's a gift that housing is so hard because I, I've never had to pray so hard about housing. And in, in the past, I would pray, you know, Lord, help us to pick the right place and, and trust him with that. But here I'm actually begging for provision. And uh, it's, it's very exciting to see God do that. And it really does grow your faith. Uh, Janet, for this, what other home buyer programs are currently happening in San Francisco? <laughs> well, before you go there, I, I thought I should tell a little bit about my story because yeah. moving to San Francisco 30 years ago, you can imagine that pricing the rental um, rates were in the three digits and um, homes on Broadway in the best neighborhood of the city were eight hundred thousand dollars they're they're trading at like eighteen million dollars now so you know when I came here things seemed a lot more affordable of course our income was a lot less um, I had the benefit of living in a building in the Portola district that my grandmother and grandparents had um, um, bought and had apartments and so I was able to live there from rent free for a little while so I had some advantage at that time the neighborhood was very very rough and um, so I thought outside of the box for myself to live in something that was a little more was affordable and I could get started um, and just a side note I moved into the building the first night I got a phone back in those days by the way my clay thing was Gumby, so you can tell <laughs> way back. And, um, so there was a phone that you, you plugged into the wall, right? And I got the phone and I called my uh, mom to tell her what my phone number was. And she said, she gasped. And I said, what, what? She said, that was your grandmother's phone number. Wow. And I called the um, phone company to say, was there any coincidence that I lived in the building where my grand, and they said, no, it was totally random. So. I felt that was some sort of calling. My grandmother had a vision. She was passionate about real estate, so it's kind of in my DNA. She bought and um, rented a lot of property in the city, not a lot, a small amount, um, modest amount. And when it was time for us to sell that property, um, I was able to then start the process of buying for myself, which um, in a way is, is a really good thing to get started so that you can start parlaying, taking the profits from these properties and buy others. And, and so in, in one way, I know you asked me to talk about housing programs, but um, to sort of create your own reality, your own um, creativity, imagination on how to get in and start so that you can um, it's an investment. It's an investment, and it becomes passive income. You know, as you're uh, as you're going along your path. Yeah. 
Okay. Do you know? Do you know of any the current buying programs? Uh, I have a neighbor who's a teacher, and she got like an interest-free loan uh, to get started with her down payment, and she doesn't pay that off until she sells the home. And uh, do you? There I, are there are programs through the mayor's office that you can um, uh, go online, and there's websites you can find uh, a lot of programs, um, especially for. Um, reduced incomes and they're going to, it looks like they're going to try to have more programs for teachers and so on. Um, it's difficult in San Francisco and it's a little bit outside of my area, but definitely you could go yeah. to the uh, city um, websites. And I think those that. programs, like that program I just mentioned, are typically tied to classes like Will's mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. But if someone is thinking, okay, I'm ready to start looking at homes, like actually setting my feet, get past the internet search, mm -hmm. um, what do they need to do to be ready to make an offer? What are the steps they need to take? Well, the market changes all the time over years. It changes right now. It's a very tight market. It's very competitive. There may be um, 10 offers, sometimes more offers for a property. Um, so when you go to make an offer with your realtor, you should be really prepared, have yourself packaged properly, have um, your financial, um, have your uh, finances pre-approved, subject to the property that you're going to be purchasing. So that means uh, you need to do an, an appraisal and have inspections on that property, but go in as clean as you can with your um, pre-approved pre loan, have your, um, your down payment available, um, have an exit um, a pattern for where you're living. If it's a, a rental, give notice to your landlord or um, be able to move very, very quickly. Um, you may have inspections before you make your offer. Uh, sometimes that's a, an opportunity for you to, there is a chance you can do that. And um, you have to be very uh, assertive and very quick. And my opinion is if it's an 80%, the 80% rule, if you like it about 80%, Go for it. Just get in. Start start the process. And Ken, you had something else in your package, right? You didn't you guys have a letter? Will you speak about that? So, I'll confess, I became very frustrated because everywhere I went, there was someone with cash, which I only had, uh, you know, approval. And of course, cash is king. So most people, from a business perspective, is going to take the cash because they can move fast, and there's a lot less risk for the the seller. Finally, we just sat our realtor down and we said, look, we're going to take control here. And we put a one-page storyline on who we were. And uh, in our particular case, that story connected with the seller. And the seller actually chose Kelly uh, at below asking. Now, we know for sure that that was a miracle. You know, that God... You haven't been here long. Yeah, so that is a miracle. That is a miracle. But to your point... We had to act, and, and so we, our way of acting was telling our story, and what we discovered is that in many parts of the city, people have empathy mm -hmm. for how hard it is to acquire real estate. And many of those who have been here for a long time want to make sure that the next person who lives in that home will love the city, will love the neighborhood, will love their neighbors. So we encourage you to do both. Have an expert, but also be willing to tell your story and give God a chance to really give us, in our case, he gave us an amazing miracle. So Ken, I'd love for you to speak into, if you are considering a neighborhood that you're not familiar with, what, what do you research? What do you look into? So in our, our particular case, I, I read a lot, you know, so we can pull from the internet, we can look at reports, but typically reports are outdated. Um, the city is constantly changing. There's a lot of truth in those reports. But there's a past and there's a future. So what we do is we walk the neighborhood. We spend a lot of time just observing the parks. We'll tell you a lot about the neighborhood. But also the commercial district. Shop the commercial district. Have dinner. Go to the coffee shop. Some of our neighborhoods still have bookstores. Go into the bookstore and look at what the neighborhood reads. You can get a, a, a pulse on who the neighborhood is. Um, and then talk to as many people as possible. You're making a life decision here, and silence is not good. Walk around and ask questions, uh, and ask them specific questions about the history 
the ethos of the neighborhood, the, the, the attitude of those who built the neighborhood, because that's going to be relevant to your, your future. Um, so, yeah. Great. I'm going to finish with this question. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, but most of us will probably be living in a smaller space than would be our ideal. So what, give us one tip for living in small spaces with children. And I, I'll focus this on these two guys. And Janet, jump in if you have something too. Um, we've, because of our situation, we have a two bedroom. Our, our boys will share a bedroom till, yeah, one of them moves out. It's, it's just the reality and I'm okay with that. Um, for those of you who have the different genders, boy, girl, and maybe, I'm not sure if you, what your situation was, maybe you can speak into this, but yeah, you have to get creative with the space. You have a lot less space in the city, and that's where the parks, the walks, um, the, the different activities uh, come into play. And to be fair to Will, he's, you guys are in the foster process, so they're not even necessarily limiting to your two boys in that room. Yes, and, and with that, we have to consider only two years and under because they have to be in our bedroom because of the, the laws that are in place. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so really good input. I would add, we, we looked for a place with an unfinished basement that we down the road could build out, but uh, Kelly and I actually live down in a third room and the, two, the kids are upstairs. Uh, you know, in a smaller space, you start to think of the space a little different. So the table is central to our household. So where we've lived in the past where we had lots of space, we, we culturally would move around the house differently than we do here. We spend a lot of time around the table, which in our case has turned out to be wonderful. And then you negotiate the one bathroom. You know, we don't have five bathrooms like my parents do in Brazil. Uh, we have one bathroom. And uh, so... You know, it does require some logistics and yeah. agreements and patience with one another. Yeah, and sometimes you, your values change. Like, so for us, we, uh, we don't use our garage to store our car, which I have always done. I grew up thinking a car must be kept nice. And uh, now I think it's great as a playroom. I'm thankful I have a playroom. And I would add for condominiums, as an example, I live downtown now in a very small uh, one-bedroom uh, apartment. I use a closet as an office. I've converted it into an office. Um, with California closets, you can really do kind of a nice renovation. We're all familiar with that. You also can use the common areas as an extension of your space. You can use their, the backyard or the uh, common area that they have for the lounges. Um, and you get creative with storage. You don't need as much. You start using underneath the beds. You, um, and also, for a single family home, you might use um, a garage for a guest room or a cottage or even uh, renting it out on Airbnb and have a nice little income. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys so yes. much. Thank you. And we're going to have Shauna finish us out.